Good evening, and we are delighted to have you all here at this uh, discussion organized by Chennai International Center. Um, we have a very eminent panel here today. Let me invite uh, Mr. Venu Gopal Kasturi, um, trustee of Chennai International Center, to welcome the speakers and begin the session, please. Thank you, Vanita. Uh, good evening. Uh, on behalf of the patrons and the board of directors, I welcome you all to the Chennai International Center the platform for intellectual discussion on issues of the day, whether local, national, or international. Last week, we had the Tamar Nadu finance minister, Parnivel Thyagarajan, explain the philosophy behind the new government's first budget presented a fortnight ago. Those of you who didn't have the chance to see it may catch it in full on CIC's YouTube channel. This evening, we have another equally topical subject, the crisis in Afghanistan. As you all know, Afghanistan is a landlocked country with a population of just about 30 million, 50% more than Mumbai's, yet its influence on global affairs has been gigantic. You'll only have to remember 9-11 and Afghanistan's role in that and how the act of the Taliban changed life around the globe. That was 20 years ago. The terrorist attack was avenged and the Taliban were vanquished by the US and its allies. India were among those countries that helped rebuild Afghanistan. Yet, now the Taliban are back on center stage once again and have taken control over the country in a manner none in the world quite anticipated. What are the implications of these developments for the world and for India in particular? To discuss this, we have a panel of eminent people. Ambassador Nirupama Menon Rao is a retired Indian diplomat and a former foreign secretary. She was India's first woman high commissioner to Sri Lanka and the first Indian woman ambassador to China. She served as India's foreign secretary from 2009 to 2011. And after that was appointed India's ambassador to the United States where she served for a term of two years from 2011 to 2013. Welcome Ambassador Rao. Professor Raghav Sharma is a director at the Center for Afghanistan Studies at OP Jindal Global University. He has worked and traveled extensively across Afghanistan and has been affiliated with the Kabul Center for Strategic Studies. Undertaken consultancies for CWS Kabul and the Aga Khan Foundation. Welcome, Professor Sharma. Suhasni Haider is Diplomatic Affairs Editor of the Hindu. Over the course of her 26 year reporting career, Suhasni has covered the most challenging stories and conflicts in many regions, including Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Libya, Lebanon, and Syria. In India, she has covered the foreign affairs beat for over a decade. Welcome Suhasni. And finally, we have Dr. R.K. Raghavan, whose face is very well known to us at CIC whose founding patron he is. He's a former director CBI and till recently ambassador to Cyprus. Over to Mr. Raghavan. Thank you, thank you, Vernu, and uh, good evening to all of you in, in the panel and among the audience. It's a great privilege and to chair such a session hosted by CIC, which has uh, become so well known all over the world, not merely in India. Uh, when I suggested this uh, topic to Vanita, she readily grabbed it and said, why not? Um, despite some criticism in some quarters that we are still too late, one of my uh, friends did write to me saying that you're becoming irrelevant and you're too late. Then I answered with saying, um, we are not competing with the Hindu or the CNN or the BBC. We are a thinking organization, we are a think tank, and we would like to comment on a situation after it has unfolded reasonably well and uh, to, the, uh, to the good comp comprehension of all those who matter in the world. 
that's why I said I'm not defensive about it. I'm, um, I've already uh, interacted with the panelists uh, more than one occasion. And yes, to, to, to take care of this criticism that we are going to recycle what has already been said, I, uh, I requested the panelists to uh, make this program slightly different from what uh, the others have dished out. And fortunately, we have a person among the panel, Dr. Sharma, who lived in Afghanistan, who has been frequenting there until two years ago. And uh, he has a fund of knowledge on Afghanistan that uh, adds value to our uh, panel today. And, uh, and I'm almost certain, I'm certain that Afghanistan has caught the imagination of people all over the world. It's not merely this region, uh, Asia alone, all over the world, they have come to know what uh, Afghanistan is about. And some people have drawn um, a parallel to what happened in Saigon uh, three or four decades ago. So I'm happy that uh, we are gathered here. And uh, my job is only to facilitate what um, facilitate an understanding of what is happening and what is likely to happen. Some kind of a crystal ball gazing will also be thrown in. And uh, uh, pardon me if I sound uh, too fundamental. Um, I thought for the, in the interest of the, uh, those in uh, the audience, some of whom may not really be uh, very uh, familiar with what Afghanistan is all about, I, I made a simple presentation which will be uh, on the uh, screen before you. Uh, just one minute. Uh, it'll, it'll consist of four, I'll try to finish it as quickly as possible. So this is, I started with the map. Uh, so not many would know that Afghanistan has border with six countries. Can you believe it? Uh, uh, beginning from the top of the, uh, the north, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, China, Pakistan, and Iran. So this is a landlocked country. Imagine what will be the situation in a country like Afghanistan, which has to tackle six neighbors. Some are friendly, some may not be all friendly, some are even positively hostile. So this is the situation in which Afghanistan finds itself and its geopolitics of this region is really worth trying to understand. Second one, a basic fact sheet, I think Werner has already referred to a few of them. Uh, it is, uh, its land mass is just one fifth of India, a population of about less than 40 million, and sex ratio, uh, 105.4 to 100 females. So this itself is, is very significant. Two languages, main languages are Pashto and Dari, and uh, the minorities speak Arabic, Urdu, and Sindhi. Literacy rate is 43.21. This itself indicates what a task the administrators, those who want to reshape uh, Afghanistan's destinies, are, uh, are, are have on their hand. With a literacy of just 43.21, how much can you transform a population? Uh, that's, uh, i leave it to you, a big question. And it's not all that impoverished. It is a poor country, but has tremendous natural resources worth about 1.3 trillion, mainly um, minerals, copper, cobalt, iron, et cetera, et cetera. And then internet penetration, again, is shocking. It's just 20% of internet penetration. Then, this is a little clutter, but I thought I should know about it. It's a long history of domination by foreign conquerors, and there's a lot of strife among internal warring factions. It's not only the those who invaded Pakistan, but among themselves, the Afghan population is badly divided. Uh, we have some history right from the Babylonian, uh, about 500 BC, um, up to Mahmud Ghazni, 329 BC. Then not until 1700s, uh, the area was united as a single country. We believe that it's a single country for quite some time, not really. It's only around 1700 that the area came to be, the geography came to be known as a single country. By 1870, after the area had been invaded by various Arab conquerors, Islamic groups, and during the 19th century, Britain, looking to protect in the Indian Empire, we were always afraid that uh, Afghan Russia, through Afghanistan, will come into India and take over. So mainly to thwart any such attempts, uh, they went in, and uh, that resulted in three Afghan wars, British-Afghan wars are three. Um, and then ultimately, 
interestingly, it became a kingdom. Zahir Shah became the king, the new king. He, he brought, uh, in fairness to him, he brought a semblance of stability to the country. In 1956, Zahir Shah was overthrown in a military coup. And uh, there was a regime by a military general, Daud Khan. The People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan came to power. And Daud Khan named himself as the president. Uh, then USSR invaded Afghanistan the same year. So the US, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Soviet Union um, in 1989 signed a peace accord in Geneva, guaranteed, uh, guaranteeing Afghan independence, which was only um, the books are not uh, actually implemented. In 1992, Mujahideen and other uh, rebel groups with the aid of uh, a, a turncoat government um, stormed the capital Kabul and ousted Najibullah the, the, from power. Then 1995, a newly formed Islamic militia, Taliban. We heard Taliban for the first time in 1995. Then in 2006, amid continuing a fight between Taliban and the Al-Qaeda uh, fighters and the Afghan government forces, NATO came in uh, play in a big uh, major uh, operation. In 2013, the army took over all military and security operations. 2014, Obama announced a timetable for significantly reducing U.S. troops. And 2019, the U.S. and Taliban signed an agreement on a peace deal that would serve, serve as the preliminary um, terms for the U.S. withdrawal. 2021, the Afghan government collapses as the Taliban stages a comeback. And uh, recently, a few days ago, there was a violent explosion in which nearly about 100 people got killed. Of course, Taliban um, blames uh, the Al-Qaeda, uh, the IS, IS, for this particular operation. But we are yet to know uh, authentically whether the blame um, laid by um, Taliban are in fact grounded in facts or not. Then, so this is broadly the uh, background picture. Then I thought, um, I just uh, applied my mind and uh, prepared a few pointers how we could sh shepherd or steer the uh, conversation this evening. I, I, I post a number of questions. It's not exhaustive but indicates the kind of problem we have in mind. Is there a prospect of peace returning to Afghanistan at all? And what should inter in the international community do to facilitate this? What will we negotiate? Who will be negotiating with the Taliban to bring them to the conference table? It's a very hard task whether you can bring such discipline to Taliban and let's hope for the best. And what is the extent of Pakistan's influence over Taliban? There are several speculations that they have put their hands in the drill and then they're trying to um, influence what's happening in Taliban and how it can be manipulated against India and the rest of the region. Then the biggest question concerning all of us, can India afford to deal directly with Taliban? Uh, up till now, it's only a backstage negotiation and the government won't own it. But Possibly there was some backstage approach to Taliban. We don't know who all took part and how. what, what is the outcome of such uh, an effort. A Taliban team visited China recently and held discussions with the Chinese foreign minister. What is the significance? I know China would like to fish in troubled waters. Uh, as Anything that hits India badly, they are there. And possibly they're trying to uh, win the Taliban fully and also influence it against India in a fuller measure. Then ultimately, what do these trends mean to India-Pakistan relationship, which is not invested, uh, which is a very, very some factor, how India, whether India should make up with Pakistan, whether there's any, any ground or platform at all for us to in, engage in any negotiations, especially on Afghanistan. Then finally, should India continue to aid Afghanistan for its development? If so, on what terms? All of you know, we have sunk a lot of money 
into Afghanistan, not expecting any, not expecting any direct uh, benefit, but as a kind of humanitarian um, measure, we have, imposed, we have we have spent a lot of money that has irked Afghanistan as well as Pakistan. So these are various issues at random. They are not comprehensive. They are not. Uh, they don't cover the entire territory. But these are points on which I request the panelists to play their minds and give give us uh, the best of their wisdom. And uh, having said this, may I request Professor Ahmed Swasni to speak and let us know what she thinks about the whole matter. And uh, we'd really be interested. She's very advantageously placed in Delhi. She has been writing um, wonderfully well on these matters. She has, I'm sure she will not be embarrassed to say she has access to the highest places in Delhi. And um, her writings reveal a lot of wisdom, a lot of uh, access to information, because you don't want anybody to write in vacuum. You like a uh, person writing, have some credibility, have access to the government. Ultimately, it's a garment which is the most powerful, and uh, that's where from where all action starts. And I uh, request, request Suhasini to begin the proceedings. Over to you, Suhasini. My, my apologies. Thank you so much for having me on this panel, Dr. Raghavan. And I know that CIC was actually quite prescient. You had planned this even before some of the events that we have seen take place. And it is certainly uh, Afghanistan is a part of, um, is, is actually on everybody's mind. Um, and, and I think that's very clear from what we've seen in the last few days in terms of even what the government has been saying. Why does Afghanistan matter? It is what is called a near neighbor. Uh, India doesn't actually have a man boundary with uh, Afghanistan, but uh, it has a map boundary with Afghanistan, if I could say that. And it has centuries of relations with the country. More than that, India has invested, particularly in the last 20 years, uh, in, in, in great ways in Afghanistan, possibly more than any of its other neighbors in terms of just the numbers of projects, 500 projects in 34 provinces across Afghanistan. Uh, a figure of $3 billion is given, but that doesn't quantify really the kind of investment India has put against all odds. Perilous projects taken on and completed over there, uh, you know, highways, the parliament, uh, the dam, Salma Dam, and as well as a port in Iran that India has fought for at all odds to try and keep as a transit trade uh, route. India has also invested in Afghanistan's democracy. And today that democracy seems uh, to have just vanished overnight. But it is a very, very strong investment because India was a part of the scripting of the constitution. It has been part of the process of democracy. It has been part of uh, conducting elections and of training the next generation of Afghan politicians. Uh, finally, India has, uh, has, uh, has worked with Afghanistan as a part of its strategic connectivity ambitions in the region, uh, which have been thwarted time and again by Pakistan stopping or blocking India's efforts. Uh, but even so, India has worked with Afghanistan trade. Uh, we've seen air routes opened up, the transit trade routes through Chabar, uh, the links with Central Asian countries with the hope that one day when there was peace in Afghanistan, that these uh, would be allowed to flourish and Afghanistan, even though it is a landlocked country, as you pointed out, would be able to fulfill the potential and aspirations of its people. Unfortunately, what we have seen in the last few weeks is without doubt a setback to all those interests of India. Um, besides that, uh, of course, there is the concern of terrorism. And India has borne the brunt of violence in Afghanistan in the past as well, when the Taliban was in power. Uh, there is always the worry of the use of Afghanistan spaces, governed and ungoverned, uh, for training camps of groups like the jaish e mohammed and uh, the lashkar e toiba that uses those spaces uh, um, uh, also to uh, to attack indians or indian interests inside afghanistan as well as in india uh, the use of afghanistan to send over terrorists this is something we did see in the 1990s and the worry is that this would uh, happen again so there is no way for india to completely disconnect itself from the events of Afghanistan, as other countries might be able to do. We've seen a certain, uh, you know, uh, lack of reaction, if you like, from all Southeast Asian countries, or even from parts of the Gulf, where 
there isn't as much of an engagement with what is going on with Europe as well. Um, but the fact is, India is affected by every event in Afghanistan in a way that it, you know, it is it has a larger role. It's not just that it is geographically somewhere near Afghanistan. So I was asked to speak about what is the government's uh, perspective on events as well as its plans for the future. So I will say that very briefly. Um, essentially, uh, the the government articulate has articulated some positions through uh, statements, then speaking at the UN Security Council, speaking at the UN Human Rights Council, and then uh, External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar uh, held a meeting for about thirty seven members of Parliament, which was a closed door meeting, but we did have access to some of what was said over there. And essentially, what the government said was that the current crisis has uh, come because of a number of factors. One was the U.S.'s expedited withdrawal, uh, bringing troops back so quickly that they were not able to control events in Afghanistan. And in fact, we're seeing the U.S. floundering when uh, when it says that it needed to pull out 2,500 troops and has ended up sending 6,000 troops more in order to bring those troops out. Uh, the Taliban, of course, has not stopped its violence all this time, but they continue to negotiate, which leaves the rest of the world in a bit of a strange position because there is a part of the Taliban still in negotiations. In fact, just yesterday, uh, the French envoy met with the Taliban's political office uh, representatives there in Doha. Uh, there was the problem with local commanders in Afghanistan striking deals with the Taliban. Uh, and finally, Mr. Ghani's exit and the collapse of the Afghan forces, which Mr. Jay Shankar had said, really led to this kind of crisis situation where the Taliban walks in unchallenged to Kabul, uh, takes over control, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it has right now some kind of a deal with the U.S. where the U.S. Is, and, uh, leads NATO forces to run the Kabul airport, but Taliban uh, commanders and particularly the Haqqani group are securing Kabul uh, and its periphery. Uh, so the second point that uh, that we understand the government made is that where they see their priorities when it comes to Afghanistan, because you're in an impasse situation. Maybe after August 31st, the dust will settle a little bit. Nobody is very optimistic about that, but it might, you know, there might be more clarity about what is uh, to come. Uh, so for the moment, for the government, the first priority has been Indian nationals, bringing Indian nationals back home. Uh, they started this process, actually, what people don't realize is in June itself last year, when the Kabul em uh, embassy was scaled down after that Herat and Jalalabad were closed or just a little before that. And this year we have seen in the space of a month, mazar -e sharif and Kandahar. So all four consulates were closed. And then finally the embassy itself was closed and all embassy staff were brought back on uh, three flights over a period of three days. Uh, the second has been the idea of assistance to Afghan nationals in distress over here. It, there has been a sense that the government is, uh, is uh, more favorable towards Hindus and Sikhs, Afghan Hindus and Sikhs coming back. But there is also a technical reason, which is that Hindus and Sikhs have traditionally held long-term visas. So it was easier to facilitate their exit uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, but there is a lot of worry about whether the government is, in fact, going to uh, uh, facilitate any more. And I'll give you the figures in just a bit. Uh, they ran evacuation flights over the period of a week, and we believe one or two more are, are, are left. But so far, and you have to put this in perspective, the U.S. has said that they have evacuated 86 or 87,000 people. I think the figure might be updated right now. Uh, so far. The government has evacuated, the government of India has evacuated 565 individuals. Uh, of those, 175 were the Indian embassy staff, 263 other Indians, uh, 112 Afghan nationals. And those included mostly, I think except for 20, all of them included the Sikh community in, uh, in Kabul and Jalalabad. And, um, and then, uh, you know, 15 people from, from other countries as well. The government has also set up a 24-7 cell, Afghan cell, which has about 20 officers of the MEA taking calls from Afghans in distress. But I'm not sure at this point what they can offer them because so far there has been no evacuation flights for Afghans who are not uh, Indian, uh, you know, uh, in, in some way uh, either linked uh, to the Indian embassy or, in, uh, uh, or our Hindus and Sikhs who they have uh, brought out from there. 
In addition, there's a lot of confusion because the government brought out something called the e-visa overnight, but no e-visas have been given yet. And everyone is asked to apply for those e-visas, but clearly security vetting is taking a very long time. And this is because the Indian embassy is closed in in Kabul. So it's very difficult uh, for them to uh, really, um, you know, uh, uh, process the security vetting. This is what we're hearing from them. In the meanwhile, they also invalidated all previously issued visas. So there were those who had visas to come here. And, you know, one of the stories that we are following very closely is that of students who won scholarships from the MEA uh, to come to India to study. And they must have won those scholarships just a month, two months ago. And today they have no idea when they will be able to A, leave Afghanistan and B, uh, come to India or to pursue their studies and their career. So there are a lot of human stories over there. Finally, uh, Mr. Jai Shankar referred to the international coordination that India continues to do. One of the large parts of that, apart from, of course, discussions with the U.S., with uh, we saw uh, U.S. commanders come to India, uh, with Russia, where uh, President Putin called Prime Minister Modi, with other countries like Italy and others as well. Uh, But September is going to be a very critical month for us to watch at the United Nations. Uh, First, there are these UN Security Council meetings, but so far the resolutions have been pretty toothless and watered down because nobody wants to take a stand right now about what is going to happen um, at the Human Rights Council as well. But what is interesting is that India is the chairman of the Taliban Sanctions Committee, or what's called the 1988 Sanctions Committee, And it will remain to be seen whether countries like U.S., like China, like Russia are going to ask some of these Taliban leaders uh, to be taken off the sanctions list or to uh, be enabled to travel, have access to funds. Uh, Amongst them are people like Sirajuddin Haqqani, and he is the deputy leader of the Taliban, could be in a very powerful position in Kabul. But he is responsible for the attacks on Indian embassies and Indian consulates over the years particularly the ones in 2008, 2009, where I think more than 75 people were killed, uh, an Indian uh, uh, IFS officer, um, V. Venkateshwara Rao, as well as uh, uh, the military attache at the time. Um, and, and lastly, Mr. Jai Shankar spoke about the question of recognition. Uh, this is going to be the single point at which you will see uh, uh, you know, some kind of clarity about the future. When countries start to decide Who will occupy Afghanistan's seat at the United Nations? Now, is that going to be a vacant seat? Are they going to continue the ambassador who was there from the time of President Ghani? Or are they going to actually consider accepting a Taliban nominee to that place? That will decide how everyone reacts. Now, uh, according to what we were told, Mr. Jai Shankar told uh, uh, um, uh, the members of parliament that this is a place where India will wait and watch and see what other countries do, whether the U.S. will uh, and the European Union will uh, acknowledge the government, the new regime in Kabul. Uh, We already know that Russia, China, uh, Iran, uh, Pakistan and Qatar have maintained their embassies in Kabul. And now the Turkish ambassador actually drove back yesterday from the Kabul airport and retook the embassy in Kabul. Um, So we are seeing at least some kind of engagement is proposed by all of these countries. Now what the U.S. does will be important. Uh, U.K., Germany and France have either shut down or are going to shut down their missions there for the moment. They've moved out directly from the airport. And for India, and I will end it over here. I know I've gone a few minutes over time. Uh, What will be important to see is what will be not just our stance towards the new regime in Afghanistan. And there are a lot of points to discuss. I mean, we could technically take a very, very tough position. And and that is a position I think Indians will really understand that we cannot do business with the Taliban, that they have not just betrayed us, they have, uh, they they, uh, work against our interests, that their coming to power is in fact a big blow for India. And it's not something that we can recognize, particularly given their record on uh, treatment of minorities, women, democracy, and all the rest of that. Uh, But there is the stance towards Indian security from the government's point of view, that India does have to look at. After all, in a situation where we do already have hostile fronts to uh, the left, with uh, to the west with Pakistan at the LOC, and to the east and the north with China at the LAC, another flank with Afghanistan, which, as I said, is not a direct neighbor, but very, very close. 
um, is going to be a problematic thing. That is something that uh, our government will have to think about. And finally, uh, and this is where I will actually end, is the government has to decide what its stance towards the Afghan people is going to be. Because in the past, the, go- uh, the government of India, India has opened its arms to Afghan uh, refugees, to people seeking asylum, to train, uh, to, to people who India has trained, to people who India has uh, allowed to study over here. Uh, there are deep links there. And uh, there is also an aspiration, or there is also an, uh, an expectation from Afghan people that India will stand by them in some way, that even in this, there are a need, and they are very troubled at present, that India will not just walk away and say that our security demands that we just shut the door on Afghans, that we just look away from our Western flank completely, uh, and we say that we cannot have any truck uh, with uh, with what the developments there. I, I don't think that is a, an option really for India, but it is still something that we need to watch and we need to uh, to follow this story really on a daily basis. I'll stop. Thank you very much for that uh, brilliant presentation. Before I move on to Raghavendra Sharma, Raghav Sharma, um, so I think may I ask you, uh, the India stand that we'd like to wait and watch um, could they have done anything better? I mean, there are some people who say, no, you can't uh, wait for too long and you have to jump in, do something to, uh, to impress the Taliban as well as the Afghan population. I personally feel that is a very good thing that India didn't want to just uh, uh, leap into darkness. But what do you think and what's the general impression in Delhi as to whether India stand that we'd rather wait, uh, uh, wait rather than jump? Um, how do you think that has gone down into people who um, formulate policy and opinion? You know, sir, I, I would say that it is a very pragmatic policy. But I do also feel that somewhere there, if there is something to cavil about, something to criticize, it is that India has lost its voice. And I've, of course, written about this uh, when it comes to Afghanistan. We have chosen to believe the words of world leaders who have not considered India's interests or the Afghans' interests. After all, if for two years, the US, Russia, and China were holding secret talks with Pakistan and something called the Troika Plus, and I say they are secret because it is only in March this year that they came out with a statement saying they had met six or eight times in the last two years, Mm -hmm. uh, discussed Afghanistan's future without either Afghan uh, people being involved or the Afghan government being involved. But for us, more importantly, We were not involved in that. There have been other uh, engagements that have continued about Afghanistan's future that have not included us. And the idea that these countries were effectively paving the way for a Taliban component, if not the whole, to come into power in Kabul um, uh, to replace the Ghani government, a democratically elected government, no matter what you think of that election, uh, means that they did not consider India's uh, interests when they were doing this. And India needed to then have projected its own voice, its own way on Afghanistan. I think we have failed to do that by somehow trusting that others will look after our interests. And I don't think we should continue to do that. I think we do need to be more vocal about what these moves in Afghanistan are doing to India or can uh, uh, can actually do to India. Thank you very much uh, for that interpretation. Can I ask uh, Professor Rago uh, to make his presentation? Look forward to it. Thank you, Sohasan. Thank you. Um, so I've been asked to really reflect on my personal insights into what, you know, um, or how I see the developments in Afghanistan. And um, just, just give me a second. I'm sorry. So I've been asked essentially to talk about, um, you know, my own personal insights Um, in terms of how I look at the developments in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, what has transpired really in Afghanistan um, is in many ways very, very personal for me because I have spent um, a fairly long time um, in Afghanistan. I uh, went there first um, as an intern in Afghanistan. And uh, this was in um, 2017. Uh, sorry, in 2007. And um, 
you know, that was my first trip when I started working for an NGO in Afghanistan. And ever since, essentially, there was no looking back. Um, I went back in 2010 when I uh, moved base to Afghanistan and I started working with a local NGO. And um, essentially, this gave me an opportunity essentially to um, travel across the length and breadth of the country, um, forge bonds of friendship, forge um, numerous personal bonds, um, which have lasted um, for, for, you know, a very, very long time. And um, in fact, down to, uh, down to this day. And um, what I do see um, happening in Afghanistan has, has touched me, um, I think, in, in a very, very profound manner. Um, now, a lot of what has transpired in Afghanistan, um, as I said, you know, it's, it's uh, deeply personal as well. And I mean, essentially, um, you know, I also went on to pursue my PhD on Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, what has happened, therefore, has touched me um, in a myriad of ways. Uh, for many, um, because for many of my friends, colleagues, uh, family members, institutional partners, this is more than just a geopolitical development. It is, I think, as uh, Suhasni very aptly pointed out, this is a human tragedy which is unfolding at so many levels. And many of us uh, do believe that this was, this was avoidable. It reflects, in many ways, a very ruthless crushing of dreams, uh, of aspirations, of souls, um, of everything that, you know, so many of us, so many of my Afghan friends um, had strived to build and what they had believed in. Uh, for the last two decades, and they do feel uh, deeply betrayed by what has transpired over the last two weeks. Uh, Afghanistan also under the shadow of, of the Taliban, since I've been asked to talk about everyday lived experiences in Afghanistan and what some of the potential challenges to Taliban rule could be within Afghanistan. What I do see is that Afghanistan under the shadow of the Taliban certainly dawns a very, um, a very different look. Uh, the most obvious, of course, is we see far fewer women on the streets, but interestingly, what I've been seeing, even the men who are out in the streets, um, you know, they don mostly the um, traditional attire. Um, you don't see the young men in, um, you know, the latest jeans and the latest Western wear. So Western wear has gone completely off the streets. So, um, you know, as far as choice and agency, even for the men is concerned, that has been constricted in a very severe, uh, severe manner by the Taliban. I know of cases personally where people have been trashed on the streets of Kabul by the Taliban. They've been made to stand in ditches for wearing clothes that do not subscribe to the worldview, really, of the Taliban. Um, and this, I think, contrasts very starkly with lived memories that you know the post-9/11 generation has had of a country where um, they've had aspirations like young people anywhere in the world. They're exposed to the world. They're connected to the world. Um, and they have, over the last two decades, pushed in very important ways boundaries on gender, boundaries on religion, uh, boundaries on culture. Um, and that's particularly true of the urban centers such as Kabul, Mazari Sharif, Herat, uh, even Kandahar to an extent. And, um, you know, oh, many of these cities in Kabul and Mazar in particular were a melting pot of cultures. Um, even in the countryside, there have been very important strides in health and education to sectors that I've worked in closely. And, um, you know, that has let, engineered a degree of change. Um, it has led to a changing worldview of people in the countryside. Um, these gains um, that have come about, particularly in health edu education, um, are both fragile and very reversible. You know, so we are at a very critical, critical crossroads. Um, also, what is equally true of, about Afghanistan is that, you know, Afghanistan is also a country which has struggled to reconcile with its past, with its turbulent past in so many ways, socially, politically, culturally. It is not entirely reconciled with its past. Um, and while it's true that Afghanistan post 9-11 has seen tremendous progress, it is not the Afghanistan of the 1990s. Um, we have seen, you know, women... Um, uh, playing a more important role. We've seen progress in education. But I think um, there's an ugly, another ugly facet, um, which I think we must also be aware of, which is that, you know, it is, uh, the other facet is that Afghanistan post 9-11 has been, you know, its landscape has been dotted with palatial mansions owned by, um, you know, uh, so-called warlords, which is a problematic term in the Afghan context. 
it is dotted by you know SUVs owned by elites um, in Afghanistan who own properties in Dubai. Um, it is being punctuated by expat, the expat bubble, um, which made for a very jarring contrast with the everyday lived experiences of ordinary Afghans. So this is also a reality of post 9/11 Afghanistan. Uh, all of that, of course, is going to be it is already being radically transformed in the last ten days. Um, Afghanistan has also seen a lot of social, intellectual, and cultural churning over the last two decades. And this is reflected not merely in the political and the military challenge that we are seeing to the Taliban in the Panjshir Valley, but um, I think more importantly, this is reflected in the protests that we've seen play out in Kabul, um, which had a few women as well protesting. Protests that have taken place, in fact, not just in Kabul, but also the very powerful rebuke that was offered to Zabiullah Mujahid at the press conference he held in Kabul, ironically sitting in the chair of Dawah, uh, 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 Mr. Minapal, who uh, was assassinated about a week ago and Zabiullah claimed responsibility for that attack. Um, you know, the Taliban, he announced a general amnesty that the Taliban was offering uh, to all Afghans. And uh, this journalist, Afghan journalist rebuked him and said, you are offering amnesty and forgiving crimes, but will the nation forgive you for the crimes you've committed against the Afghan nation? Um, and that was, I think, a very brave thing to say, uh, given the circumstances that they're operating in. That's really not, not something easy. But more significantly, what we've also seen is that there have been protests against the Taliban coming from the Pashtun belt in Jalalabad, Khos, Paktia, Paktika. The Taliban have been, um, you know, the flags have been ripped down from public places and replaced with the flag of the Republic. And this is significant because the popular conception everywhere has been that, you know, the Taliban is a Pashtu movement. That's a very problematic construct, and I don't have time to talk about it at length right now because there's a time constraint. But the fact that you have these protests coming uh, out in the Pashtun belt and outside the urban areas, I think is very significant, and it tells us about the kind of social ferment um, that we are seeing in Afghanistan, and, and we need to perhaps pay more attention um, to this. And this underscores also the fact that, you know, there is the whole question of legitimacy. Uh, so the Taliban do not necessarily enjoy even pan-Pashtun legitimacy. Let's not talk about pan-Afghan legitimacy. Um, these are important changes, I think, that we need to um, stay tuned to. Um, now, it remains to be seen how the Taliban will engage, how will it negotiate with these changed social realities. Another changed social reality that the Taliban will have to negotiate with is that the old socio-political contract in Afghanistan has been renegotiated in light of the civil war, right? And that is particularly true for groups like the Hazaras and the Uzbeks, who for very long been outside the realm of political and military participation. All of that has changed. So the question that remains to be seen is that will the Taliban be able to overcome what Oliver Roy had, um, you know, very famously described as the failure of political Islam? Will they be able to transcend that failure of political Islam? That remains to be seen. And I have my doubts that they would be able to navigate that successfully um, through negotiations alone, because the kind of rhetoric we are seeing emerging, particularly from the provincial Taliban leadership, is not very encouraging. There are already reports of Hazaras being killed in Malistan and Ghazni. And just today, there's been a video doing grounds of the Taliban leaders in Hazaraja saying that once we have an order from our Amir, uh, we will not leave even one Hazara alive. So I think it remains to be seen how would the Taliban um, grapple with the changes Afghanistan has seen. Um, I think the other very important challenge that the Taliban will face, apart from the political and social challenges that they'll have to navigate, is how would they deal with the... Uh, actually, before I talk about the economic challenge, a very interesting anecdote which I must share with you. I was talking with... Um, um, very old friend of mine, and he said, you know, uh, forget Kabul, even in, um, you know, Jalalabad, even in smaller towns, uh, particularly in the Pashtun belts, uh, people actually mock the Taliban cars when they pass by. And, um, and I quote him, uh, you know, he said, um, people laugh at them and say, and I'll say this in Hindi, and I'll try and translate it so that at least the essence is not lost. So what he said to me was, uh, they tell the Taliban fighters, aapke baalo mein se jume gir rahi hai. But the, aapki daadi jo hai, wo unkempt hai. 
इसको ठीक कर लीजिए अपना हुलिया बदल लीजिए clean yourselves up um practice some basic hygiene which is again um you know it's it's a very subtle passive way of um uh, registering their protest against the taliban and the kind of ethos that they represent which is actually traditionally alien um to the pashtun culture um last i'll talk about the economic challenges um you know the economic challenges are going to be very profound as well for the taliban uh economic duress has mounted of late because the banking system as we all know has totally collapsed for the last 10 days uh people have not been able to access money uh, that is in the banks a lot of government servants have actually not been paid for the last 3 months um prices of essential items are rising in fact today there was a protest in uh, sharena which is in the heart of kabul uh against the taliban calling on them to um open the banks and get the services up and running and have a government in place um and the taliban were being cursed essentially on camera um so i think the economic duress is only going to mount with time and it's not just the banking system which has collapsed even the hawala system which is used for transferring money has come to a standstill um uh, traders in pakistan are not dealing in the afghani currency any anymore because it's fluctuating so badly um so that gives us a sense of the the um scale of economic disruption that has been caused uh by the ongoing political uh, developments in afghanistan um another um tangible uh barometer of the economic disruption that's been caused has been you know the rows and rows of household items that are on sale on the streets of kabul jalalabad mazar e sharif these are items that are being sold either by families who have nothing to eat they have no cash so they are putting their household items on sale or their items that have been sold off by families that have essentially packed their bags and run or are planning to run from afghanistan um so the uh, you know how the taliban grapples with this challenge remains to be seen um the fact that you know the a very large chunk of the educated and skilled youth from afghanistan are making a dash for run outside the country uh is going to be a formidable challenge uh, for afghanistan because the taliban do not have technocrats to run the government um in fact many of uh, the people i've been speaking to tell me that you know everybody who is um you know in positions of authority under the taliban they're mostly mullahs and uh, technocrats are um not particularly enthused to work under them um plus of course there is the fear of taliban rule so uh this is going to have very profound reverberations because when the us took over afghanistan it was a country that was broken in every possible way um it was not producing professionals so uh, two decades of training skilling educating the youths uh, more or less uh, seems as if, as if it's going to be wiped out um so this is really going to make the problem of transitioning from being an insurgency to being a governance you know the transition from insurgency to governance is going to be very problematic for the taliban and again from what i'm hearing from friends in the ngo sector and please don't quote me on this uh, you know uh, the taliban uh, their mentality again seems to be that they are an insurgent movement in the mountains so um, just a few days back they had a meeting um, you know with ngos and said you can resume your work but we want a 10% cut in the projects that you execute right uh, when this was reported to you and ocha not by one but i know for from at least three to four um ngos working in afghanistan they convened a meeting and the taliban well flatly denied it they said well we never said it these guys misunderstood but re- repeatedly the the um sense one is getting from people on the ground is that the taliban are struggling to essentially make the transition from an insurgent movement to governance and their mentality um has not changed you know and um i mean personally if you ask me maybe it's a biased opinion i think taliban 2.0 as it's called um uh, hasn't changed dramatically um i think they have changed in the sense they are more uh, apt at managing the media they're better at managing the optics um they um, uh, are better at uh, you know um staging but i think in essence the taliban have not really changed um they are brutal with with the terrorist organizations um and we can talk more about that perhaps in the discussion so i hope i've 
uh, not over short my time too much. No. I'm sorry, disruption no. in between. And thank you very much for that uh, vivid description of what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, Before I go on to request uh, Ambassador Rao to speak, <coughs> um, do you see the prospect of uh, women in Afghanistan, those who have benefited from the absence of the telephone, will, uh, any prospect or, or is any evidence that they will all gang together and offer at least a semblance of resistance to the Taliban? You see it, or is there, is there any prospect at all? Well, there is there is some nascent resistance to the Taliban already. Uh, you know, on the second day of the Taliban takeover itself, there were protests. But again, at the moment, these are very limited. These are spontaneous. There is no organized effort at the moment, um, essentially, to offer resistance to the Taliban. Uh, I think that is going to take time. So we are not going to see that fructify um, immediately in the near future. That is my sense. What about communication? You, you said uh, you had an active touch with a few people in Afghanistan. Um, how is the communication network just now after the uh, return of Taliban? Is there any change in terms of uh, um, accessi accessibility? Accessibility to? Telecommunication like internet or telephone. At the moment te telecommunication is working. And um, there is certainly some pressure on the Taliban because, um, you know, they are they are interested. They claim for international recognition. Um, they do want development aid. Um, therefore, it's, I think it's going to be very hard for them to completely turn Afghanistan into a North Korea. Um, so that has not been disrupted in any significant manner. There have been disruptions, but not um, there's not been any significant disruptions that they've tried to, at least for now, try to cut Afghanistan off. Uh, from the world, although the Taliban spokesperson has been saying um, that, you know, um, again, this is unofficial from friends, from family, uh, they say we don't want the young men to leave Afghanistan. So it's not just the educated, but also the young men. Uh, so they are trying to sort of create an environment where we might see some restrictions and movement eventually. Um, how this will pan out, I think, remains to be seen. Um, once the international troops depart and also once media attention begins to wane, um, I think things will become clearer. Is it possible to clearly clearly identify regions in the country which will put up resistance if there is a flare up if opinion galvanizes itself and uh, if there will there be some organized effort in regions which are not exactly in favor of Taliban, do you, uh, uh, can you possibly identify areas uh, roughly? Well, well, that's uh, uh, that's difficult to say. I mean, we have resistance in Panchi, yes, but the question is, uh, how would that resistance be sustained? Uh, because Panchi is landlocked. That is one. Uh, you know, the whole um, geopolitical scenario around Afghanistan has transformed radically. So even if, let's say, India, for instance, may have been interested to throw its weight behind an Amarullah Saleh, uh, hypothetically speaking, um, it would be very difficult because the Iranians and the Russians, and I think Suhasmi would, and Ambassador uh, Rao would uh, test to that, you know, they've been pretty much on the same page with the generals in Rawalpindi as far as outreach to the Taliban is concerned. And there is practically no way that India can have the Tajiks on board um, in supporting the resistance. That is one. Um, second, um, you know, I think uh, it's going to be difficult um, for any resistance, large-scale resistance, um, to fructify in, in the near term. This is going to need some time. Um, this will take about a year or so, at least, for the resistance to, to gather some strength. Um, so I think it's very going to be very difficult for us to see any large-scale resistance to the Taliban immediately. Um, this may change uh, in, in the near future. But at the moment, things look um, not so optimistic. Let me put it this way. Thank you very much for your perspective comments. May I now request Ambassador Rao uh, to, request, uh, to make her presentation and give us the benefit of her wisdom in terms of her experience in diplomacy, especially as Foreign Secretary, as India's Ambassador to the US, all rolled into one. She is generally recognized as a, as a friend of knowledge. And may I request Mrs. Rao to uh, begin her presentation? Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Raghavan, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be back at the Chennai International Center as part of this very distinguished panel. The panelists before me have spoken very comprehensively and brilliantly about the current situation, and uh, I'm going to make my remarks as brief as possible, given the time constraints uh, available at this uh, webinar. So I'm going to start by, uh, I'm going to preface each part of my statement with a question. The first one I'm going to ask is, have the last 20 years made a difference for Afghanistan? Now, my first trip to Afghanistan was in 2002, soon after the Americans had entered the country and launched what they called Operation Enduring Freedom. Afghanistan was a desolate wasteland of a place, and one Western diplomat I spoke to cynically reminded me that in that country, all you could do was, these were his words, rearrange the rubble. Was what we saw in the last 20 years a mere rearranging of the rubble? No, 20 years did bring a resurgence, at least in the creation of an Afghan middle class in cities like Kabul, more schools, more hospitals, more education, more connectivity with the modern world, a vibrant visual and social media, more space for women, most importantly in various professions, as also in politics, and improved health standards and higher rates of literacy. But 20 years, in my view, did little to address the radical Islamist roots that had also grown deep in Afghan society over the last four decades. The Taliban, who the Americans had ousted, faded away into Pakistan and the Afghan villages. And after a few years, they came back with a vengeance, literally trampling out the grapes of wrath against the Western invaders, as they call them. Meanwhile, even as aid and development money poured into Afghanistan, and uh, Raghav just mentioned it, it created a new comprador class, deeply corrupt and misaligned with true Afghan nationhood, soon an object of revulsion and rejection among ordinary Afghans. My second question is, how have the Americans handled the situation? Now, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan was a foregone conclusion. They came to hunt down Osama bin Laden and destroy Al-Qaeda. Theirs was not, they keep saying, a nation-building operation. Even if they spoke of enduring freedom, they did lose blood and treasure in Afghanistan, and successive administrations wrestled with the idea of scaling down troop presence and finally withdrawing altogether. But there is a saying, all of you know that, if you break it, you own it. Four decades ago, the Americans nurtured with the help of Pakistan, which has always felt that, I quote this from Ziaul Haq, the water in Afghanistan should boil at the right temperature, unquote. And uh, the violent Mujahideen, uh, you know, they nurtured the violent Mujahideen with the help of Pakistan to fight the USSR and weaken it irrevocably. And once the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, the American involvement with the Mujahideen was ended, so to speak. But the seeds of radicalism in the name of jihad against the Soviets as part of a Cold War agenda had been sown. And after the Cold War ended, I mean, whatever you may say, the climate thus created raised the curtain on the civil war in Afghanistan and the creation of the Taliban in Pakistani madrasas as fresh recruits for a jihad in that country on an ostensible mission to purify Afghan society destroyed any prospects for peace. To this extent, for the Americans to say that they are done with Afghanistan lacks all conviction. Afghanistan is not done with America. Its specter will haunt the United States as far as the region is concerned in the manner in which American power is perceived, and it will hollow out the very principle of American championship of democracy and civil liberties around the world. And the terrorism that caused the explosions at Kabul airport has every chance of flourishing again in Afghanistan, making it a hotbed of such violence for the region. We all have reason to be worried. Would retaining 2,500 troops in Afghanistan by the United States really have cost America all that much? 
capitulation to the Taliban. In fact, General McMaster calls it the capitulation talks uh, at Doha with the Taliban. The capture of trillions of dollars worth of defense equipment and sensitive data. The closing of the American embassy. The images of abandonment of military bases. Leaving Afghan national defense and security forces to abruptly fend for themselves. The failure of intelligence. All this is bound to cost the Biden administration dearly, both domestically and on the external front. My next question is, what is the likely scenario going to be? The scenario for Afghanistan is very gloomy, with heavy turbulence, upheaval, violence, and human suffering, especially for women and children. It is a political, economic, and humanitarian catastrophe. Countries like Russia, China, and Iran, all of whom have retained their embassies in Kabul, have their work cut out for them. They are staring into the abyss. And if various factions of the Taliban remain disunited and radical Islamist groups also join the fray, as far as the outside world is concerned, it will spell great challenges and difficulty in building a solid and stable presence in Afghanistan. Refugee flows from the country across borders into neighboring countries will be a given. We are witnessing a humanitarian tragedy and it is certain that Afghanistan will be a highly dangerous place. My next question is, can India do business with the Taliban? India has not done business with the Taliban previously. I remember the former, the then foreign minister, Mr. Jaswan Singh saying, uh, the good Taliban is an oxymoron. Those were his words. And perhaps that uh, is something we still have to grapple with. It is believed that some very preliminary and very tentative contacts have been made. But I think these are insufficient to build the contours of a viable Afghanistan policy in a Taliban-dominated country. In the last 20 years, India dwelt constantly in the shadow of a Pakistan-driven threat in Afghanistan. This was even when a friendly country, the United States, was present in the country and offered some reassurance in terms of security. India was not a strategic player in Afghanistan, and I think Suhasini alluded to this, and its voice was not much heard in Pali's about the country's future. It was there to do good for the Afghan people, and it did much good, winning hearts and minds, but that was not good enough in building any power base in Afghanistan. In a Taliban-dominated country, however, faction-ridden it may be, the, uh, Pakistan is going to be a lead player, even if its own society is made more vulnerable to attack by anti-Pakistan factions operating from inside Afghanistan. This means that matters will be even more complicated for India. On the one hand, India is scarcely at home with the Taliban. And on the other, the Pakistan factor makes India's going difficult as it is. I do not see Af India going into Afghanistan in the near term. The policy in New Delhi will be to wait and see and making contact with countries like Russia and Iran to see how the situation is unfolding. With China, which says that it is for an inclusive Afghan government and an end to violence, there is need, I believe, for India to keep the communication channels open, even if for the only reason that China stands as much to be affected by violence in Afghanistan as other countries in the region. But Pakistan plays a significant part in China's Afghanistan policy, given the close relations between the two and that will always be a complicating factor for India. Does, does building bridges with Russia help for India? Building bridges with Russia certainly helps. Russia understands Afghanistan well, and it has open communication channels with the Taliban. Our time-tested ties with Russia are too valuable an asset to squander. And Russia's counter-terrorism credentials are solid. It is sensible to align our interests with Russia's in Afghanistan. 
Further, this could help open channels to the Taliban and craft a way forward in terms of the next steps we contemplate in Afghanistan. A similar dialogue and outreach to Iran will be equally relevant. Now, will Pakistan change its colors? Will it continue to hinder our presence? Pakistan's anti-India policy in Afghanistan is not going to change. It will never favor a stable presence for India in Afghanistan, despite this being in tune with the wishes of a majority of Afghans. But this cannot mean that India gives up on Afghanistan. We must not give up because the stakes are too high for us as a big power in our region to just abdicate our interests and goals in Afghanistan. Our aim should be to reopen our embassy in Kabul, even if the consulates may remain closed indefinitely, so that we can be a force for the development and welfare of the Afghan people. This possibly will entail recognition, definitely will entail recognition of the fact that we cannot have a no linkages policy with the Taliban. The next few months will be key as the rest of the world wakes up to the new realities in Afghanistan. We need not be among the first to recognize the Taliban, but we need not be the last either. Our diplomacy must have a perfect sense of timing. Otherwise, the initiative may backfire. I'll stop here, Dr. Raghavan, because Thank I know that... Thank you very much. You can't be... You can't put it better than this, and uh, it's very illuminating. And uh, one question: um, Pakistan, I mean, Taliban, is, um, is, is definitely hostile to India um, because we are not in Pakistan. But is it true to is it correct to say that Pakistan is less uh, hated by Taliban because Taliban is not exactly a great friend of Pakistan, but he makes use of Pakistan. But uh, is it correct? Is it only religion that keeps the Taliban naturally closer to Pakistan than to us? Does religion play a major role in this, uh, all these uh, dynamics? Well, uh, in terms of Afghanistan being a very deeply tradition, traditional Islamic society, especially where the rural areas of the country are concerned, I'm sure they could possibly be a meeting of minds at some level uh, with Pakistanis in general. But if you take the Afghan, uh, if you want to define Afghan nationalism in particular, I think there is not much love lost between uh, Afghans and Pakistanis of, of whatever shade or whatever tribal group they belong to. And, you know, Raghav talked about uh, the Pakhtun, uh, you know, attitude to the Taliban, for instance, that uh, not all Pakhtuns are Taliban and not all Talibans are, you know, uh, Pakhtuns devoted to their, you know, to the Taliban cause. So in that sense, I don't believe that Pakistan has a ready-made uh, captive audience in Afghanistan. In some senses, I think you will agree, uh, sir, that Afghanistan has, in many ways has been a hostage state to Pakistan. Pakistan has looked for strategic depth in Afghanistan. Its generals, the Rahul Pindi clique or the group, uh, see the, the present topography of Pakistan is not providing sufficient strategic depth against India, particularly in the event of war or conflict. And they've always looked for that strategic depth in Afghanistan. And that's why, to, as I, I quoted Zia ul Haq speaking about keeping the water in Afghanistan boiling at the right temperature. Yeah. So I think that will be uh, Pakistan's attitude to Afghanistan, even in this post US withdrawal scenario. To what extent Pakistan will be able to? Uh, secure all its aims to its advantage? That's a big question because the canvas is so muddled today in Afghanistan. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I don't belong to the establishment any longer. I retired quite some time ago. Um, am I right in saying that uh, no other government in Delhi could have done any better and it will be unfair to blame New Delhi for anything happening in Pakistan? In, in Afghanistan, or that can anybody say that any, any another government could have done better 
in handling the refugees or repatriation or to see that uh, the Taliban uh, did not come back. I don't think, I, 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 I'm the view, it will be unfair to criticize the present government. You didn't do enough to keep cultivating Taliban and did not do anything to prevent them from doing all that <coughs> done in the past fortnight. What do you think? Uh, is it a charitable? Uh, I think generally the press and the media, they've all been charitable towards the government in the sense that they've not criticized um, the Modi government overtly, saying that you should have done better. What do you? What is your position in this? Would you have done anything better in this? Uh, well, uh, sir, I think I draw reference to what uh, Suhasini said. I think it's been a bit, rather pragmatic approach that the government of India has adopted under the circumstances. Uh, I don't think there was much of a menu of options to choose from, to be very frank. And the third point is that there is really a continuum uh, that stretches back for 20 years. You know, we uh, sort of lost uh, any advantage that we possessed in Afghanistan uh, after the fall of the Najibullah government, you know, the uh, the whole chaos that ensued in Afghanistan, the advent of the Taliban, the experience with IC-814. And then uh, even after the fall of the Taliban post 9-11, if you look at the last 20 years, we came in under the shadow of U.S. occupation in Afghanistan. We were not, um, I, I, you know, to be very candid, we were not strategic players there. And uh, we had a very hostile uh, neighbor, Pakistan, literally, uh, you know, we had to constantly look over our shoulders, if you, if I may put it thus, in terms of security, our personal security, the security of our embassy and our consulates in Afghanistan, because we were the target of hostile action from Pakistan. In that sense, that constrained our activities, our uh, ability of our ability to maneuver in that situation very, very strongly. And this has nothing to do with Prime Minister Modi's government. It had also to do with the previous um, uh, UPA government. I think uh, it has a, it ha we really have to introspect a great deal about our own position in the region, our neighborhood policy, our Pakistan policy, uh, the fact that a lot of our difficulties in Afghanistan arise, the difficulties that India faces in Afghanistan arise from Pakistani hostility, which stems again from the hostility between India and Pakistan. So uh, there are so many wheels within wheels here, and uh, it's very difficult. It's a tangled web, really, really a tangled web. Thank you very much. Would, would Suhasni or Raghav have anything to say at this juncture before we throw open the proceedings to Q&A. Would you like to add to what uh, the, uh, Mrs. Rao uh, uh, said uh, just now? Maybe Suhasni, would you like to go first and then I can come in? Or... Well, I mean, the only part I think we don't uh, uh, seem to consider is until just a few months ago, India was a major player. Um, the MEA's own statements would refer to uh, Afghanistan as an immediate neighbor and um, constantly pushed for India's uh, presence at various rounds of talks, various quadrilaterals and all the rest of that. I find it that part the most difficult to understand that when you have so much capital in a country where um, you know uh, uh, survey after survey has found that India was the most popular country amongst Afghans when they spoke about countries that they trusted, uh, that you have, uh, you know, a, on a strategic level, had such a close relationship. In, in, in 2012, uh, India was the first country to sign a strategic partnership with Afghanistan. We have helped them in so many ways and benefited from that help in so many ways because India has been, you know, key, uh, a, a key development partner, a partner in training, a partner in education, so the, the idea that we can walk away from this, I find very difficult to fathom, but that is unfortunately the, the direction in which a lot of uh, public narrative is going at present. I certainly hope that that is something that will be corrected. There must be an understanding 
that this is uh, not just a part of India's neighborhood. India brought Afghanistan into the SARC, for example. But it, but you know, the relationship with Afghan people has to be something we can't give up on. We can't just say, oh, they now have a government that we don't agree with, uh, that we may not even recognize. Uh, so therefore, the Afghan people are left to their fate. I think that would be a, a betrayal of the hopes and the trust that India has uh, received from them. Um, so I'll just add very quickly on two points uh, that both um, Suhasini and Ambassador Rao have made. Um, so one, of course, is the point of India, and I think Suhasini very aptly drew attention. You know, you broke down the figures in terms of evacuation. Uh, a record is not particularly good, and um, I mean, forget evacuating normal, ordinary Afghan nationals, even so-called allies of India, former ministers, uh, people who've served in high diplomatic positions, they've studied in India, they speak the language, they've been our allies for 20 years. We've not even got them out, we've not even issued them visas. You know, um, I've had, again, I can't name uh, the people, but a former minister in the government, you know, got in touch with me and said, can you please issue me um, a visa support letter? Because, um, I mean, the ME has set up a room, there is no response. I myself, for personal reasons, have written to the, to the MEA room, tried to get in touch with them. They never get back to you. They don't get back to people who've supported India in the last two decades. So, um, you know, that gives you a, a sense of where we stand. A lot of uh, people in civil society, intellectuals um, in Afghanistan who have come up over the last two decades, many of whom have studied in India, they said, well, um, you know, India is like a second home. We love India. We go there for holidays. We go there for medical tourism. There's a great people to people connect. But, you know, even though we've spent 10 years of our lives, lives in India doing a master's, even some of them have done PhDs, India has a terribly inflexible visa regime. Um, the Pakistanis, in contrast, even though we detest the country and we haven't taken any favors, they actually come to our offices and say, what do you want? Do you want visas? You want to recommend people for scholarships? What do you want to tell us? We'll give it to you on a platter. Of course, there are strings attached to it. We know that. Uh, but, you know, that has led to India losing ground. Um, that's that's an uncomfortable reality, I think, that we need to, um, need to uh, contend with. Um, uh, you know, on the Taliban and, and the meeting of minds, I think, again, it's very important to keep in mind, um, you know, the Pashtuns have been historically the most fragmented Politically, So even during the period of the so-called jihad, there were at least um, six parties that were recognized um, from amongst the Pashtuns. And interestingly, if you look at who Pakistan has supported, uh, the Pakistanis have never supported parties amongst the Pashtuns that are either nationalists. So parties like the Afghan Milat have never been supported by the Pakistanis. The uh, group supporting Zahir Shah was never supported. Even amongst the Mujahideen parties, people like Pir Gelani, for example, right? Um, Mujahidis, they were not the favorites of the Pakistanis. The Pakistanis have been interested to support a radical Islamist constituency amongst the Pashtuns, uh, to begin with Hekmatyar and later the Taliban. And a lot of it ties into the belief that if they nurture this radical constituency, Islamist constituency amongst the Pashtuns, it's the best way to undercut Pashtun nationalism, uh, which is really a thorn in the heels for the Pakistan army. Uh, because of the whole issue of the Duran line, which even the Taliban never recognized. Um, so, uh, you know, th there is a certain logic as to why the Pakistanis have nurtured the constituency they have. And um, I think this anxiety is not going to go away anytime soon, because once again, what you're seeing on the Pakistani side of the Duran line is a lot of political and cultural ferment in the form of the Pashtun Tehfuz movement, uh, which actually the Pakistani media is not allowed to cover. You know, and they too have been fairly daring in taking on the army. And uh, that is a source of huge discomfort for, for Pakistan. And I think the challenge for them is how they're going to grapple with that. And third, uh, very quickly, I know we're out of time. On China, I mean, all I'll say is let's not forget that the Chinese have had the best working relationship with the Taliban even in the 1990s. Um, the only, um, um, uh, you know, diplomat uh, from a non-Muslim country who met Mullah Omar even in the 90s was Chinese in, in Pakistan. And this has actually been attested to in at least by three different leaders of the Taliban I interviewed in Kabul at different points in time, uh, including the then foreign minister, uh, Mutawakil.
so the Chinese have nurtured that constituency fairly early on, and again, this my assessment is that uh, that nurtures that that probably stems from um, their belief that Pakistanis perhaps will not be able to control the radical elements or the reactionary elements maybe um, entirely on their own. Um, so the Chinese have been uh, nurturing these contacts for a long time. And the only four embassies that are working, as was pointed out, are the BRICS, you know, the Pakistanis, Russians, Iranians, and Chinese in Kabul. And I think that in itself is a political statement of where things stand at the moment. Um, so, Ambassador Rao. Uh, sorry sorry I, I to bother you, sir. Uh, I think uh, if we could just move on to the audience question in about a in few okay. minutes. Yeah. Oh. We have some Only one question to sure. Ambassador Rao. This question of issue of visas, this has always been vexing and a uh, lot of complaints, not only vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan or Afghanistan, any other country. So uh, there's a general feeling that uh, issuance of uh, visas become highly politicized, highly centralized, and not many people are not able to com come to India. This may be a, a, a kind of an overstatement. What do you think can be done to handle this? Well, uh, as far as, sorry, am I muted? No. Uh, well, as far as the current situation in Afghanistan is concerned, uh, and I really would not like to comment on visa policy because EMEA does not act alone when, as you know, when it comes to visa policy, the Ministry of Home Affairs is very, very intimately involved. And it is essentially the arbitrating uh, or the deciding authority when it comes to visas for foreign nationals entering, entering India. So as far as the question of issue of visas is concerned, in the case of Afghanistan, um, even before the uh, decision to introduce e-visas, I'm sure there must have been special scrutiny of Afghans coming into India. I mean, we have reasons, obviously, to be, uh, as they say, better, better to be uh, safe and secure rather than be in a hurry when it comes to issuing uh, visas uh, for, for countries uh, which are considered to be especially sensitive. But uh, I think the dilemma for, for India today is essentially to be sensitive to the humanitarian aspects of the situation. And I think um, uh, Professor Sharma referred to it, Suhasini referred to it. There is a humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in Afghanistan today. I know personally from many young Afghans I know and whom I've worked with in a particular uh, field of activity. I set up a, 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 a symphony orchestra a few years ago and we worked with a lot of young Afghans. And it is so, it's so sad and tragic uh, to, to uh, receive messages from them. They are desperate to get out of the country. Uh, they cannot uh, express themselves in the new dispensation. Uh, they don't want to be seen or heard while they are in Afghanistan, but they obviously want to come out. And I think a country like India, which has been so geared towards the people dimension of relations with Afghanistan, should not let go, should not be insensitive to this aspect. Because if we do, we are going to lose a constituency in, a, in that country, which was our sole source of strength and support. And if we are to lose that, I think, you know, we'll be set back by, you know, decades in Afghanistan. Thank you. I agree with you. Um, Vanita, can we go on to the Q&A? Yes, sir. I think there are some questions on the QA panel and also on the chat, although some of them have been redirected to the QA panel, if you see. Okay, would one of them speak? Or you would like me to moderate? Okay, uh, I think we could just uh, kind of take it from there, sir, as discussed. Um, you... I'll read out from you. Question mm -hmm. from Mrs. Ms. Eiber. In a piece dated January 20th, Mr. Biden will come to office with a will of empathy and, and uh, resolve, borne by personal tragedy as well as the depth of experience forged from more than four decades in Washington. The question is, would you endorse the depth of experience of President Biden in, light of, in the light of his decision and their consequences in Afghanistan? If yes, why? 
So there is also another question for Suhasini. So maybe if we could just club both, she can then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, would, be, uh, yeah. would Pakistan be adventurous now along the LOC in JNK? If they are what, if they are what might be USA's position? Then one more. Is there any rivalry or enmity between ISIS and the Taliban? Please go ahead. <clears throat> these are these are very very complex questions, and uh, without putting a plug for it, I will say that on ISIS K, the Hindus website has quite a few stories on what this group is and uh, what are its links with the Taliban, and whether it is possible to separate all these threads of terrorism. After all, the Taliban still are part of a UN sanctioned, uh, uh, you know, and designated uh, group. Um, so. And so the answer to that question is, yes, uh, there are links and I would urge you to, uh, to turn. I've just finished actually a full video on the, uh, on the issue of ISIS Khorasan, which is a group that really came out of uh, another misshapen pullout by the U.S., if I may say so. Um, because, you know, so much of what we are seeing is whether it was the U.S.'s support to the Mujahideen, then the pullout from Pakistan. Uh, in the uh, in the 80s and the 90s, then it was the U.S.'s uh, 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 intervention in Afghanistan in 2001, but then pulling away to go for another intervention in Iraq in 2003. Whether it has been uh, the U.S.'s pullout from Iraq and then intervention in Syria in 2014 that then led to ISIS, or whether it is this particular intervention and pullout that seems to have been mishandled. Uh, there are many questions and troubling questions to be asked about a group like the ISIS Khorasan, which did not exist before 2014. Uh, to the other question of whether Pakistan is going to uh, now up the uh, ante at the LOC with India, I think we have to work with the threat perception that Pakistan will do its worst over there. Uh, simply because, uh, to begin with, the pressure is off when it comes to its western frontier. Uh, the pressure of a government that was constantly pushing Pakistan on the issue of terrorism, uh, the ANDSF constantly reminding Pakistan to stop support to terror groups uh, in Afghanistan, all of that has now gone away with a friendly government placed in Kabul. So there will be more time to focus on uh, their hostilities with India. Uh, clearly, there is already a situation in Jammu and Kashmir, and Pakistan has made it clear that all relations with India hinges on what happens in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, and uh, it is not helped by the fact that Pakistan and China have this deep compact uh, aided by the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, that is, is definitely putting India in a situation of greater uh, threat perception. Whether or not is, it is actualized does not really matter. We still have to prepare for that eventuality. And in fact, in, in, on another subject, I've often asked the question that when our resources are going to be so clearly demanded at our northern frontier, our western frontier, our eastern frontier, basically our continental frontiers, how much resource can we then put into the U.S.'s new project, which is the maritime one in the Indo-Pacific? But that's a debate for a different uh, time, I'm sure. Um, and to, the, to the, the first question that was really asked about Mr. Biden and when, whether he has shown empathy towards Afghanistan or not. Look, even in 2009, when Mr. Biden was vice president and in charge of deciding, or he would, was making those trips to Pakistan, making trips to Afghanistan, many uh, stories about uh, what he did while he was there, uh, really showing his interest in trying to find a solution. His answer, even at that time, had been to tell President Obama that it was time to pull out. Uh, that it was time to acknowledge, uh, and, and he's been quoted as saying this in, in several books, that Pakistan was actually a more important ally, uh, and to leave Afghanistan really as a problem for the region to deal with. So he has acted out on that belief. There are some who ask whether uh, he was so wedded to his idea from when he was vice president, that he has failed to see change realities. He failed to see the fact, for example, that if you were in 2001, 2008, looking at Afghanistan, you may not have noticed that the Afghan society had changed, that there was this whole new generation that today is 20 years, you know, if it was born in 2001, it's today 20 years old. 
Um, it's a youth that was really looking forward to a very different future for Afghanistan. It's a youth that is today had its hopes crushed. So many have left the country saying their hearts are broken because of what they had hoped to achieve. You know, uh, um, uh, Rahul has, has spoken about so many of these groups like the art lords in Kabul, the collectives in other, uh, in other cities that suddenly brought a vibrant cultural landscape to Afghanistan. The fact that the U.S. continued on a path that perhaps had been set out by some military commander a decade ago without taking into account the fact that there were now so many more people who had so many new hopes, that is disappointing. But there are also very specific questions. And, 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 and Dr. Adam, you, uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as, a, as a person who has dealt with this kind of policy, uh, strategic policy, uh, would also wonder why the U.S. did what it did. Uh, to continue to talk to the Taliban, despite the fact that the Taliban kept no promise. The only promise the Taliban kept was that American soldiers would not be harmed. But apart from that, uh, a no ceasefire, no push for talks with the Ghani government, no push uh, to uh, build a new government there, no push uh, really to cut links with terror groups, uh, no push to stop the violence in Afghanistan. And despite that, the talks continued. In uh, Doha, as if, you know, it somehow it would, would be peace would be the end game of this uh, very violent process. That's, that's, that's something that baffles one. Also, the very specific decision to pull out a Bagram base when you had no guarantees from the Taliban uh, is uh, strange uh, at the least. Today, the U.S. is uh, dependent on a place like the Ahmed Karza International Airport, which is essentially a commercial civilian uh, airport. And, and the kind of attack we have seen Perhaps they could have been more secured if they had retained Bagram Air Base because, uh, Bagram Base because there are enough people now drawing a complete line from the day the U.S. pulled out of Bagram overnight without telling anyone on July the 2nd to the Taliban's confidence and advances through Afghanistan and finally the takeover of Kabul and all the cities within a week. Um, so many think that that was the real signal that Mr. Biden sent out by saying, no, I will go ahead and empty out Bagram base, which is the U.S.'s biggest base over there, has all kinds of uh, security parameters, not as the last thing the U.S. did, but as amongst the first things the U.S. was doing in, in this final phase of the pull-up. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I don't want to personalize this because it is not just Mr. Biden. Before him, there was Mr. Trump, who even thought that he was going to call the Taliban and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and President Ghani to Camp David. Before that, uh, there was President Obama, who had different uh, strategies, the surge, the pullout, the surge, the pullout. Uh, and, and there was, of course, President Bush, who, after having in, uh, uh, intervened, invaded Afghanistan in 2001, promising then to build a democracy in that country, then moved his entire focus away to an unfinished sort of uh, mission in Iraq, both of which then turned out to be a disaster. So, I mean, while we can say that Mr. Biden perhaps could have shown a little more empathy instead of saying, you know, the Afghans have to deal with this themselves and we don't have any part of it. Uh, the truth is he's just the last point in what has seemed to be a very uh, disconnected policy with what was changing on the ground and what was happening. And my final question has to be, um, I, and this is not aimed at just being, you know, sort of Pakistan bashing, but I do have to ask, what was that U.S. policy that in 2001 designated all of these leaders, 135 of them, as Taliban uh, uh, designated, uh, UN designated terrorists at the Taliban Sanctions Committee? Uh, sorry, 20 years sorry, later. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Ambassador Rav uh, wants to leave now, just in case uh, Sraghavan has some, uh, you know, finishing words for her. Sure. I'll stop over here and, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, and, and Ambassador Rao, if you'd like to. Um... Thank you, Ambassador Rao. If you would like to add something to what you've already said. Now, I, just uh, know I, have a, I have a report. I don't think you will, uh, will have any specific knowledge. There's a criticism that the Biden administration has just gifted away uh, military equipment worth $85 billion uh, to the Taliban. How credible do you think this... Um, statement uh, could be. I don't know. I know it may not strictly belong to your province, but what's your speculation on this? Uh, well, the fact is that uh, the U.S. 
withdrew in a rather precipitate fashion. I agree with Suhasini that there is a long uh, trail that goes back to previous administrations, all of which were were grappling with this issue of when to withdraw from Afghanistan, whether it should be a surge, whether it should be a withdrawal. So, um, you know, you really can't uh, pin, uh, pin, the, pin the tail on the tiger, as it were, as we used to say when we were children. Uh, the fact is that uh, how, in terms of the precipitate withdrawal that has taken place, it it stands to reason that the U.S. left left behind everything they had there. I mean, they just left. They upped and left uh, as they did from Bagram in early July. So, uh, and with the very, very uh, quick capitulation of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces before the Taliban, it may be true that some of uh, the forces may still be around in hiding, you know, there could be, uh, you know, turbulence in the next few days, but a lot of equipment has fallen into the hands of the victorious Taliban now, and it's all state-of-the-art equipment. More, uh, a more worrisome uh, piece of news that one has heard is that uh, the Taliban has also captured biometric data, which, uh, you know, belongs to people who worked, Afghans who worked with the Americans, which would then make them targets of, of retribution from the Taliban. So uh, it really uh, points to a very, very towering debacle, let's say, on the part of the Americans in Afghanistan. For whatever reason, you can argue there are lots of people in, 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 in America that argue that, you know, they, what could the Americans have done? They couldn't have, you know, changed Afghanistan. But as I said in the beginning, you know, uh, you own it if you break it. I mean, the, Afghan, the Americans, uh, you can't say that the concept of, uh, of sin or being uh, sinners in Afghanistan rather than being sinned against doesn't apply to them. Don't you think in the context of reports that uh, Taliban and Jaish e Mohammed and all uh, and other terror organizations are in a league, this kind of, uh, this report should be most troubling to India rather than to any other country uh, because it can be freely used against India, can be uh, can pass hands and then uh, be used by terrorist organizations which have a sanctuary in Pakistan to be used against us. I think we should uh, be really concerned about it. I and agree with you. I think there's every reason for us to be concerned and to be doubly, triply, uh, you know, manifold vigilant because of uh, the unfolding situation and all the disturbing scenarios that are coming out of Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Uh, such an uh, uh, engaging discussion and we could go on and on. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. I know you have to leave now. Um, Thank you. And uh, sorry, Suhasini, I mean, you can probably continue. There are a few questions here. Um, Sorry, in the interest of Thank time, you. I don't know if you would like to take just one last question, sir. Or that, um, that is one interesting question which confounds me. There, one person has asked me: Are the Taliban Sunnis or Shias? Do they have extensive support from any specific country in the Islamic world? Another another question: Why is the Middle East so silent about recent events in Afghanistan? Either uh, Suhasni or uh, Professor Sharma can, or both can answer, give brief, brief responses. Um, so, you, um, you, uh, yeah, well, I mean, the Taliban is, of course, a, a Sunni organization. Uh, mm -hmm. Do they get support? They did in the past, uh, you know, get uh, the, the three countries that actually recognized them in 1996, which is the core of their base originally, was Saudi Arabia, UAE, and um, uh, and Pakistan. Uh, since then, of course, things have been estranged with both Saudi Arabia and UAE for different reasons. With the Saudis, because uh, of uh, their insistence on not sending Osama bin Laden back. Uh, and uh, with the UAE after an attack on UAE diplomats in Kandahar. Um, but the interesting thing, that question that you've asked about uh, the silence of the Middle East is very interesting because right now we're seeing countries like Turkey and Qatar taking a more leading role with the Taliban in talks with the Taliban. Then we are seeing Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And that is because also of the tensions between Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia. 
and mm. the UAE. If you remember, they boycotted them. Over yeah. Things. So when the Taliban was based in Doha, these two countries were obviously not very happy with the idea because they had actually uh, uh, cut off relations uh, with Qatar. Uh, so it remains to be seen because you know this will be an area of contestation. Not to mention Iran itself. Um, over the next uh, few years, there is no way that Afghanistan is suddenly just going to be able to cut off from all these external influences. Another reason why India needs to remain very, very engaged. Uh, Raghav, would you like to add something? Very, very quickly on uh, the Taliban, and I think there's a good question on the collapse of the Afghan army. So I'll try and be very quick on this. Uh, the Taliban has traditionally been a Sunni group. Um, Right, and uh, they were known in the 1990s for their hostility to the Shias, particularly the Hazara Shias, because the Hazaras are differentiated by both their sectarian affiliation but also their ethnic affiliation. Um, ethnicity is a very problematic um, issue and a very complex issue in the Afghan context and difficult to define. But Hazaras stand out because of their physiognomy, right? And it's not just the Taliban, by the way, even Masood, who's um, given a larger than life role and um, he's hero worshipped in parts of Afghanistan and in the external world had a very um, checkered reputation when it came to groups like the Hazaras. He was seen as being responsible for the massacre of thousands of Hazaras when he was defense minister. So, um, you know, they've, they've had a very uneasy relationship with the Shias. Uh, the Taliban have consciously tried to change that. So they've tried to undertake recruitment in Hazara areas, but also in uh, non-Pashtun areas, right? And if you look at how the provinces fell this time, uh, they made a very conscious decision actually to take provinces in the north, northeast, northwest. So provinces like Badakhshan, Herat, you know, they fell first. Although they could have easily taken up places like, picked up places like Paktia, Paktika, Khost, it was not very difficult for the Taliban. Uh, this was a conscious attempt by the Taliban to demonstrate uh, that they have pan-Afghan, pan-ethnic legitimacy. And I think one thing which I must very quickly flag over here is that the Taliban have a lot of support, um, primarily not just in the Pashtun belt, but they have penetrated to a certain degree other areas like Badakhshan, for example, and uh, Nuristan. Badakhshan, have, they've penetrated because the elites, like the uh, son of Rabani, you know, they, they have not been able to retain even traction in um, their home areas like Yaftal in Badakhshan. Uh, there's a growing network of Pakistani madarsas over the years, which, um, you know, have penetrated into um, areas that have not been the traditional stronghold of the Taliban. Same goes for places like Nuristan, which is an interesting uh, province to study because it is non-Pashtun. It's the last province to be converted. And it was the first province which established uh, Islamic Emirates in the 19, early 1980s in Afghanistan. Uh, so the core of the Taliban is Sunni, although they have had some increasing uh, increasing recruitment amongst the Shias, but uh, they have not been able to jettison the anti-Shia uh, rhetoric and the anti-Shia agenda that it, they had originally espoused. Um, so that partially answers the question on, on the Taliban. Um, and they have had support, A, of course, from uh, Pakistan, uh, but let's not forget the Iranians have tactically been supporting the Taliban for a long time. And that a lot of that has to do with the politics between Tehran and Washington. Uh, we don't have, have the time to get into the nitty gritty of that. On the collapse of the Afghan army, I think that's an important question because I think Joe Biden has pretty much been lying through his teeth when he says that the Afghans essentially didn't fight and ran away. I mean, that's essentially a big lie because uh, the amount of troops that the Americans have lost in 20 years is the number of troops on an average, if not more, that the Afghans have lost each year since the Americans intervened, right? Um, uh, also, I mean, um, how do you explain um, the heavy fighting that took, places, took, uh, took place in provinces like Helmand, uh, in places like Farah, Faryab, and you had large-scale internal displacement, which is still, uh, which is still um, very much present in Afghanistan. Um, that took place because of, of fighting and the larger number of troops um, that the Afghans lost. Why did the army collapse? I think the death knell rally was sounded uh, when Trump signed the Doha deal by completely sidelining the Afghan government. Uh, also, the way the Americans had built the army, a very centralized structure, a lot of political interference in the army, and the fact that the army was heavily, heavily dependent on, on the Air Force, even for basic things like food supplies. Uh, so when the Americans pulled out, uh, they essentially pulled the plug to a great degree um, on supplies. So you had posts 
that were abandoned because the people didn't get food for two months or three months. So there was practically no way that they could they could defend um, uh, their outposts, you know. And uh, of course, this was also a grave uh, political failure. Contractors were also withdrawn by the Americans. Uh, so I mean, there were a lot of logistical challenges that came up subsequently, you know, as the American withdrawal um, gathered steam. Uh, so they could not keep the military machine uh, afloat, so to speak. Thank you. So I Thank know you. Stop. Thank you, sir. Um, should we should we wind up yeah. the discussion? Uh, I, I, I think we can wind up. Uh, very some very interesting questions. I think many more I would like to ask questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and I must thank the panelists for giving us such a panoramic view of what's happening in uh, Kabul and elsewhere. And uh, this is a real feast. I learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure many of uh, participants, many of the, of the audience, were well, <laughs> benefited by knowing what's happening. It, it very exciting, interesting days that are ahead. Um, the government of India is in an unenviable position. They, of course, everything to indicate that they are very really active, but they won't like to commit themselves to any particular position so soon, so fast. And I don't think you can blame the government for this. The situation is still evolving, very dynamic. So many players in the field that we should not uh, um, do anything to disturb uh, friendly relations with many countries. Of course, Pakistan needs a closer watch. Uh, we are really worried that um, the, the um, situation that still the, the Pak Prime Minister himself has taken a position welcoming the return of Taliban, which is very significant and uh, very mischievous. And, uh, so there is everything on the uh, on the floor that requires the government of India to be extremely worried. It's not as if they are not already very cautious, but we um, in the country um, we, we would love to watch, monitor the moments, uh, happenings in uh, Afghanistan mm -hmm. and neighbourhood, and uh, things are really um, boiling, and mm -hmm. uh, we will interestingly watch and possibly give. Um, uh, all possible support to the government. Not that I'm canvassing support for the government, but I feel after so many years in government, I personally feel that our government have done well in monitoring, but I don't know. There may be critics who would like would have liked them to do something better, but too soon to uh, criticize uh, the government because not very charitable. We need to wait for some more time. As we in the CIC was waited for a while, to convene um, a meeting of minds. I'm happy that uh, so many could come. I'm, deli I'm delighted to have been able to conduct the uh, discussions. Look forward to a future session, if not on Afghanistan, but on an equally volatile region of this world. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thank Venu Gopal would like to just add on. Yeah, yeah, let me add my thanks to the panel, uh, Ambassador Rao, Professor Sharma, and Ms. Suhasni Haidav for an illuminating discussion and to uh, Dr. Raghavan for guiding the discussions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And our next program hopefully should be an in-person program. Um, oh. We will uh, send out the mailers soon. Um, Next, I think it, it will be on September 3rd. Um, look, look forward to our emails. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Suhasini. Thank you, Professor Rahul Sharma. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.